The Ubud Writers and Readers Festival returns with the theme Mulat Sarira, self-reflection, which is a Balinese Hindu philosophy, a spiritual principle of examining our actions, thoughts and values to ultimately build the deepest sense of self-understanding, wisdom and interconnectedness in the pursuit of Dharma, the truth. These are not normal times and many of us are still trying to value and evaluate the turbulence of this journey to navigate a path to calmness, comfort and clarity. The festival will delve into self-reflection and beyond, into cultural introspection, human rights, animal rights, the environment, and to examine who we are, what unites and divides us, how we coexist on this planet, how we care for our planet. We will delve into tangible and imaginary landscapes across fields of dreams, of oceans, mountains, into deserted islands, ancient temples, jungles, forests, villages, cities, Bali, our beloved home, and Ubud, a place whose name simply means Obat, medicine. To which parts of normal do we wish to return and what lessons learned will we take into the future? Join us in a festival that promises to be extraordinary because Bali is extraordinary. Join us in a festival that promises to be extraordinary because Bali is extraordinary. Um, my name is Vera, and I'm the moderator for today's session uh, with Ian Burnett about his amazing book, Joseph Conrad's Eastern Voyages. Um, before we start, I would love to officially welcome you to the Ubud Rogers and Readers Festival 2021. Um, this year, the festival returns with the theme Mula Sarira, or self-reflection, which is drawn from a Balinese Hindu philosophy. So from the 8th to the 17th of October, we will explore the meaning of self-reflection, cultural introspection, and human rights, examining who we are, what unites and divides us, and what drives our actions. And so therefore, it is very fitting that in today's session, we will be discussing Ian's book, which in itself is a reflection of works of the past and also of history. So without further ado, please welcome Ian Burnett. Now, Ian. <coughs> Could you please tell us about the book? All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Vera, and uh, welcome everybody. So, Joseph Conrad's Eastern Voyages. It um, it really interested me because I wasn't sure how many Indonesians or Indonesianists like myself 
are actually aware that Joseph Conrad wrote six books, which were set in Indonesia or as it was then the Dutch East Indies. Mm. And so these books, um, Almire's Folly, An Outcast of the Islands, um, Lord Jim, The Rescue, and um, uh, Victory, uh, were all set in Indonesia in the late 1800s and tell different mm. stories about, uh, about that period because Joseph Conrad was a, a sailor, uh, mm. a, real sa a real sailor, a sailor of yeah. sailing ships and um, spent a lot of his time sailing around, uh, well, sailing from, from England to Singapore around the, uh, the archipelago, the Indonesian archipelago, and yeah. also to Australia. So there's, um, and his books really relate to his own experiences, what he saw and experienced as a, uh, as a, as a sailor uh, in the different parts of the, of the East Indies. Mm. It's, it's very interesting. And I think I'd like to know sort of what was the process of researching this book? Because you've written, you yourself have written so many books on Indonesia. You've written six books and a lot of them are uh, uh, like with Indonesian background. How different was the experience of writing this particular book? Because when I was reading the book, it was, it was sort of a marriage between Joseph Conrad's life and, but also you also draw links from his life and how it influenced the book he's written. So what was the process like, the research and the experience of writing the book, if you could tell us? Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's wonderful working with Joseph Conrad because <laughs> his books, uh, you know, they're, fi they're fiction, obviously, they're novels, but they mm. include his life experiences and have many, you know, autobiographic, autobiographical parts from his life yeah. experiences. Yeah. So if you have some idea of where he was and what he was doing, um, you can find uh, direct, direct words or in his own words of what he was doing in his books. Mm. So it required re reading a lot of Joseph Conrad's books. I think I read 14 or 15 My of God. his books yeah. and his short stories and pulling pieces out from those books that you could put into the first part of this book, which is really a, a biography of, of Joseph Conrad. So as you said, the biography is there, but it also includes what you might consider an autobiography written by mm. uh, Conrad that I've taken excerpts out of his own books to, mm. uh, to make it more interesting for the, for the reader and, and for, for myself as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, how long did it take for you to research? This, this entire um, project? Well, most of my books take a couple of years. As yeah. we discussed in the preliminaries, this went a lot quicker. Yeah. <laughs> because the last year I was, or most of the last year I was in lockdown. Yeah. And um, here in Australia. And yeah. lockdown is a gift to writers, a gift that doesn't happen very often because there are no interruptions, there's nowhere to go, nobody to yeah. see. <laughs> um. So I, I had guesstimated I would finish the book by the end of, uh, what was it, 2009, 2020, 2019, mm. um, 2020, I'm confused now. But anyway, it went, it went a lot faster than I had expected. Is what, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, um, I, 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 I enjoyed reading his books. I must admit I skimmed a lot of them perhaps to get to the, the points I was looking for. Mm. But, um, you know, he is, he is a great writer and uh, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed uh, working on this, on this project. It was, it was uh, mm. a lot of fun for me. So while most of us in 2020 last year were just chilling and watching Netflix, you were being very productive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You thanks were to, uh, riding up a storm. Yeah. Thanks to COVID-19. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you first come across Conrad and his writing? Like, when, when was it? Sure. Well, I would have read Conrad as a young man. And uh, oh, I'm sure okay. I, I'm, remember that uh, Lord Jim was the first book I read. 
And uh, yeah, that's that really struck me as being interesting. And I, of course, I knew that it was set in uh, in the archipelago somewhere. Um, and then I reread it recently, obviously for the book. And the first time I really didn't know where it was in the archipelago. And the second time I, uh, I thought it might be in Sumatra. I don't know how I got to that conclusion. Um, because Conrad in his, in his books, or at least in these early books, doesn't reveal the settings. Uh, where is this, this outpost up the 40 miles up a river mm. somewhere in the, in the archipelago, which uh, he refers to as the, uh, what is it? The last forgotten outpost uh, of civilization. So that was intriguing to, to find out where the books were set. And, uh, you know, there's a, a number of literary detectives before me that um, researched this and basically uh, figured out uh, where, the, uh, where the books were located or these early books were located. But mm. I certainly did my own research and uh, followed up on those, mm. those ideas. And, and that's represented... Uh, in the book, as you would have seen, uh, yeah, even with with images and photographs of the uh, of the river and its location. Yeah, so I guess to the people watching this who's not familiar of Joseph Conrad, like myself, like I find really interesting that you know he started his um, sort of adult life becoming this amazing seaman. He was a sailor, and he was a serious sailor. Like this, he he wasn't on a you know, he wasn't, he wasn't just sailing for a year or whatever, but he was a serious sailor. He's, you know, dealt with so many hardships in, in, through his sailing life. And it just made me realize how hard that life is at sea. He's dealt with explosive cargo, turbulent waters, diseases, injuries. And then he became a writer. So from that very adventurous life, he sort of transitioned into a work from home situation. <laughs> um, so how, 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 how did he feel about that sort of sea change in his life? Was it written anywhere in his books about his reflection about um, changing careers? Yeah. Well, not really, um, but it dates back to his early life because his parents, especially his father, were, were, he grew up in a literary environment uh, mm. in Poland, in a, well, what was then a, a Russian part of Poland. So he grew up in a literary family. His father was a writer and translator. Um, but unfortunately, his parents were both um, Polish patriots and were act actively campaigning against the the czarist uh, you know, rule of, of Poland at that time. Yeah. And they operated a, an underground newspaper and campaigning against oh. uh, the Russians and the Tsar. Yeah. So they were both arrested and sent off to concentration camp or a gulag in northern mm. Russia. Mm. So uh, Conrad went there from the age of three Till the age of nine, he lived in this concentration camp and was mm. obviously self-taught, I presume, mm. by his parents and by his father. And, um, the, you know, people were meant to die in these camps. So his, his mother died of tuberculosis and his father uh, was about to die and was then released. So um, at the age of nine... Conrad was uh, was an orphan, but he'd absorbed a lot of this liter literary life and knowledge from his father and from his mother as well. So, uh, you know, that, that was the very beginnings of his interest in literature, although he doesn't mm. write about that very much in his books and his biographies. But then at the age of 17, he would have been liable for conscription in the Russian in the Russian army, which his grandmother and his uncle, who were his guardians, 
thought that would be a death sentence because yeah. of his background and his parents' background, that he would never get out of the Russian army or would never get out alive. Yeah. So he sought to escape from Poland and, and went first to France and then eventually to, to England where he joined the, the British Marine. And mm. he was stateless. He had no papers. Yeah. But at that time, um, you know, Britannia ruled the waves and uh, the British Merchant Marine carried something like 70% of the world's commercial cargo. Mm. So anyone who could stand up and was momentarily sober could hire mm. on as a, in, as a yeah. seaman, and, and that's what he did. And that be, that's yeah. how he began his life, uh, as, a, yeah. as a seaman. Yeah. Was his first journey, was it to Australia, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, yes. His first big journey, was it on the Palestine ship? Uh, no, it was on... It was on the, um, the Duke of Sutherland. Oh, so that's right. So the Palestine yeah. was his first voyage to, to Indonesia. Indonesia, in sorry, East. correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was um, where um, he had his first introduction to, uh, to the Far East because the Palestine was carrying a cargo of coal. Mm. And unfortunately, coal can self-combust. Yeah. So the ship uh, began to self-combust somewhere near the Straits of, um, of, uh, Straits of Sunda, the Sunda Straits, and eventually caught fire. And uh, Conrad and the crew were able, they had plenty of warning, so they were able to get on the, the ship's boats and uh, wait till the ship finally uh, collapsed and sunk. But that's when uh, Conrad, I think he was 19, maybe 22, 22 at the time, uh, he was so excited to, to captain his first vessel, uh, to be the captain of his first vessel, which was a 14-foot rowboat with uh, two other crew members. Uh, but he writes about this in his book, Youth. And this, mm. of course, is his first introduction to Indonesia. And I might yeah. just read uh, a passage there because sure. he's describing... Um, going in this rowboat towards somewhere in uh, around the Straits of the Sunda Straits. Mm. And he writes, uh, and I'll read it, uh, suddenly a puff of wind, a puff faint and tepid and laden with strange odours of blossoms, of aromatic wood, comes out of the still night. The first sigh of the east on my face, that I can never forget. It was impalpable and enslaving, like a charm, like a whispered promise of mysterious delight. So like many of us, uh, um, many of us have become uh, enslaved by this whispered promise of uh, mysterious delight, uh, Conrad mm -hmm. and probably also myself included and many others that mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. 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 I suppose that's um, another question I have for you is, um, my one of my favorite parts in your book is when you wrote about Conrad's experience um, on the ship Vidar, I think, when he was sailing through Borneo, and he felt sort of like a sense of camaraderie with the Indonesians. Let me just find that passage that I really like. He said, you wrote in this book that you know, his voyages were in sunlit seas and among races, which like his own, had retained their pride, even though they had been defeated by a colonizing power. And so I thought it was very interesting that he felt that sense of camaraderie with um, the people on the ship, Indonesians and, and other ethnicities. Um, and in turn, do you feel like you could relate to Joseph Conrad since both of you, you know, hold Indonesia in such a special place in your heart and, um, have discovered Indonesia at a young age and all that. Sure. Well, well, firstly, about Joseph Conrad. Um, obviously, he was a linguist. He spoke Polish, Russian, then French, then English, and I, I think he spoke some German as well. Mm. So he would have picked up uh, Bahasa Malayu, the Bazaar Malayu, which was the trading language around the islands. 
Um, and on this ship, the Vida, there was, uh, well, there was uh, a, a European captain and chief officer who was Conrad, uh, two um, European engineers, but then the rest of the crew, there was a Chinese engineer, there were 18 ships, officers, I guess, who were Malay, either out of Singapore or Java or Bugis, he doesn't really say. Mm. And there was something like 80 Chinese stevedores as well who were mm. bringing cargo on and off the ships. Yeah. So he would have learned Malay and would have conversed with all these different uh, people from the islands. And he says uh, somewhere that he learned their, their loves, you know, their interests, their, their mutual dislikes, if you want to say that. Mm. Um, so he learned a lot about all the people on that, not only on that boat, but also at every port they stopped because he was, you can tell from his books, he was an acute observer of humanity. Uh, mm. He wasn't at all a colonialist or a, you know, a white, mm. the white, uh, superior white uh, racist. Yes. Yeah. So he, um, he had a very different take and a very unique take on, uh, on the people of the islands that, that, he, that he met. Mm. Uh, and, of course, to answer your question about myself, um, I first arrived in Indonesia more than 50 years ago, uh, wow. which gives you an idea how old I am. As a, wow. as a young 20-year-old, but uh, coming from Australia, you know, growing up in an Australian country town to, uh, to go to somewhere like Indonesia, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's two countries in the world, two neighbouring countries in the world that are so different than Australia and Indonesia. Mm. So to come from a small country town to Indonesia, it was just so totally different. Mm. And, um, you know, not everyone gets over that, I think. But for me, uh, I just fell in love with how different it was, how interesting it was, how interesting the people were, mm. how many different ethnicities, religions, history, islands. I mean, there's just so much to learn and understand about Indonesia that it can become a lifetime, uh, a lifetime exercise, which, uh, which yeah. it has. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you, you did have the Conrad experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wanna, and we arrived about the, sa about the same age, I think, and, and we both, uh, oh. we both, both uh, experienced this whispered promise of mysterious delight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I thought it was interesting that that little ship Vidar, where you, where you described he had, you know, a diverse crew on his ship, um, was apparently some of the happiest times of his life. Is that, is that correct? Well, that's what he wrote, yes. Uh, yeah. He said that, uh, you know, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't have better chosen his comrade and his life. And um, he was recovering. He'd had a, a nasty accident on a sa one of the sailing ships. Uh, he'd yeah. sailed from um, Amsterdam to Semarang in northern, on the coast of northern Java. Java, yeah. With a with a cargo of Dutch wood, but on that voyage he'd been struck by a, a falling spar, mm. and had injured his back and had serious back problems and pain. Mm. And he went to the doctor in Semarang, and the doctor said, "Well, you need three months of complete rest." Mm. And he went from there to Singapore and spent, I'm not sure how long, in the hospital in Singapore. But then he chose to serve on the Vida because it was, you know, sailing on calm seas, the Java Sea. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and he could uh, recover from his from his injuries. So uh, that was also part yeah. of part of his reason to be on yeah. the Vida. Yeah. Yeah, because I suppose before the Vida, he was he was on several several journey that was challenging. Exactly. Um. Yeah. 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 And there was a there's a little chapter in your book which talked about this really interesting event that happened um, that was also mentioned in Joseph Conrad's book, Lord Jim, about the ship that carried um, Muslim uh, 
people who were about to do pilgrimage to Mecca. Could right. you tell us about that? Because I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know that this had happened in the past. My ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a true story. And, um, you know, when Conrad was, uh, was rescued from the, from the uh, Palestine after it uh, uh, caught fire and sank, they were taken to Singapore. And that was 1881. And the, uh, the true story of the Jeddah happened in 1880. So mm. just a year before that. And there were, there were maritime inquiries um, subject to that. So it's quite likely there was a maritime inquiry going on in Singapore at the same time that Conrad first arrived mm. there. Yeah. But the story of the Jeddah is that uh, it was a Singapore ship uh, owned by an Arab family and it had picked up, it was, I think, a regular pilgrim ship. So it, it had picked up pilgrims in, uh, Muslim pilgrims, obviously, in Singapore and then in Penang. Uh, so there was 900 or somewhere between 900 and 990 pilgrims on board. And they were wow. sailing to Mecca to obviously um, uh, conduct the pilgrimage. And they got into uh, a storm in the uh, Arabian Sea. Um, the ship was listing. It looked like it might sink. And, well, the reasons are detailed in the book, but you know, the, the captain and the crew of a sinking ship should be the last to leave. Mm. In this instance, whether it was racism <laughs> or fear or fear of there weren't enough lifeboats, there was 990 people on board and I think seven lifeboats that could accommodate maybe a third of that number. But anyway, the captain and the crew left the ship assuming it was going to sink. Uh, and not wanting maybe to experience the panic that would have erupted, uh, left the ship in the lifeboat and were picked up and taken to Aden and reported there that the ship had sunk mm. on, uh, on this particular date. And then the following day, the ship arrived in port yeah. in Aden, towed by another vessel with all the, uh, all the 990 pilgrims still alive. Yeah. So of course, this was a huge, huge, huge event and was written up in all the papers and criticised yeah. that uh, contrary to the law of the sea or the unwritten law of the sea, uh, the captain and the crew, including our, the character Lord Jim, uh, had left the boat and abandoned its passengers, which was a just a huge unheard of and uh, experience, mm. thing to happen. So when Conrad yeah. arrived in Singapore, that would have been news all over the town, and I assume yeah. the official inquiry was still going on. Yeah, and it was. It was another, I think, eighteen years before he wrote the book. But obviously, that story was there, just waiting to be written. Yeah. And of course, the second half of the story finishes up in the uh, in the river. Uh, I think he calls it the. Pantai and the village of Patusan uh, in East, mm. East, East Borneo or Kalamanta. Mm. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that you write that he wrote the book 18 years after the event, but I'm surely that left a huge imprint, that, that event. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating story. Um, and continuing on Conrad's journey after um, his rest at the Vidar, he then he then sort of had that yearning to go back and to go back to the big seas and do sailing again. Um, what was his journey after that? Was this the one where he went to Mauritius? Uh, yes, but first, well, he came back to sing, he he signed off from the Vidar because, as you see, he wanted yeah. to. He wanted to further his career. By this time, he was a first mate, and he already had had his actually had his captain's ticket. Mm. So he went back to Singapore uh, and was presumably waiting for a ship 
to take him back to London where he would then uh, seek another ship somewhere that would be sailing on the world's oceans. So he was sitting in Singapore waiting and um, he got this message from the, uh, from the harbour master in Singapore to go and see him urgently. And what had happened was a, a sailing ship that, uh, well, the captain on a sailing ship had died at sea uh, while the ship was uh, going from Hong Kong to Bangkok. So the ship was waiting in Bangkok and uh, needed a master. Conrad had the ticket, he's saying his master's ticket uh, sitting in Singapore. So he sailed to Singapore and that was when he uh, joined the Otago. And there's a couple of books he wrote related to that. Yeah. Uh, one was in the in the mirror of the sea. Another one is uh, uh, well now it's escaped me, but um, but yeah, there's a couple of books that he wrote related to that event and his first experience as a captain on a ship. But he uh, the ship had been chartered to bring a, a cargo of teak logs. Oh, that's from, right. Yeah, uh, from Bangkok to Sydney. Uh, and then Melbourne. So he sailed. Uh, he sailed to Sydney and Melbourne, and then back and forth on a few minor voyages, bringing wheat or commodities from Adelaide or Melbourne to Sydney and back. And then he got this. Uh, the ship was chartered to go to Mauritius mm. to collect a cargo of uh, of sugar. And so he took the ship to Mauritius, uh, and this is where. You remember he met the be wonderful and beautiful yes. Eugenie yeah. Renouf, uh, yeah. and his proposal for marriage to uh, to her. Yeah, so he quite liked Ma Mauritius, didn't he? Because of the the French community that was there, and obviously he also met this French lady um, that he fell in love with. Yes, um, well, he he spoke French. Uh, he had perfect yeah. manners coming from a noble Polish family. Um, and he really had very little home life. All this time he was at, well, you know, he left. Oh, that's right, yeah. He left Poland as a refugee. He had no home life, except maybe on the Vida might be the closest thing to, that yeah. he had to a home life. Yeah. So to go to Mauritius and, and uh, you know, there was a French colonial Creole society there and to uh, mix with families and have wonderful family events and picnics and, um, you know, he just that was just fantastic for him. Mm. And, of course, he fell in love, uh, which uh, would have been wonderful except that his proposal of marriage was, uh, you know, the, the family, um, for whatever reason, didn't consider that a sea captain might be suitable for mm -hmm. Eugenie. Um, and uh, so his vow for of marriage was refused, uh, which left him heartbroken. And the reason was that she was engaged to someone else, but Eugenie had never mentioned that in their private conversations. Yeah. And it turned out that someone else was a cousin, so who knows how, how real that was. But he was heartbroken and uh, said he'd never come back to uh, Mauritius again. So... Yeah. Very unfortunate ending, yeah. yeah. But there's a beautiful description of Eugenie in the in the book, which uh, which I really enjoy. Oh. Okay. And so after after that journey to um, Mauritius, what was what was his next adventure? Um. Well, then the uh, the Otago was was chartered to go back to Mauritius again. And he refused. He said he would never go back. So he had to uh, yeah. to resign as captain uh, or whatever the word is. Um, and then he went back to London. And that's when uh, when he so by then you know, steamships were taking over the ocean, the most of the trade. So it was becoming harder and harder to get uh, work on sailing ships and to get work as a captain on sailing yeah. ships. 
So he had time and he started writing uh, the first book, which is Almire's Folly. Mm. And, uh, and then another disaster occurred because he, uh, he had the idea he wanted to go to, well, he'd been to deep, deepest, deepest, darkest Borneo, and he had the idea to go to deep, deepest, darkest Africa. That's the right, Congo. Africa, the Congo, yeah. So that's when his adventure in the Congo and the, what resulted as the uh, Heart of Darkness, Heart of darkness uh, yeah. occurred. Which uh, I have, I've sort of given minor detail in the book because I figure people want to know about that. But uh, so he kept writing Elmire's Folly when he was in the Congo. Oh, Retur okay. Well, he resigned after he had a, I think, a two or three year contract, but he resigned after three or four months because of how bad it was mm. and how sick he was and how he was. Uh, just revolted, revulsed, I guess mm. is the right word, by what mm. was happening there. Mm. So, um, so he uh, he came back to England, but he was suffering from all sorts of uh, medical problems because of yeah the diseases he'd caught there, and I think uh, what we know, call now post traumatic stress. Mm. So it took a long while for him to recover. Yeah. But it gave him more time to work on, on Elmire's Folly. And then he finally got, got back on board uh, a sailing ship as the chief officer, which was the Torrance. Ah, uh, yep. Which was his, really his last voyage on, uh, on a real sailing ship. But he spent uh, yeah. two or three years sailing from London to Adelaide and back, yeah. uh, I think, two or three voyages back and forth. Uh, yeah. Again, which he really enjoyed, and it gave him a chance to recover yeah. from his Congo experience. Oh, yeah. yeah, and at that time, I think he remarked that that torrent ship is very fast, wasn't it? For the for, for the time it took, it was it was a quite a fast ship um, of its time. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, it was. Um, it was probably uh, I don't know if world famous, but uh, it had the record for sailing from London to Adelaide. Uh, in only 64 days, mm. whereas a lot of Conrad's other journeys would have been 100 and well, one I remember was 109 days. Yeah. So it was a very fast uh, ship and a very famous ship. And yeah. it carried passengers as well, but only first-class passengers. So it was sort of <laughs> set up as a yeah. top of the line. Top uh, of the line. Passenger I ship and, uh, and merchant ship. And yeah. would, it sailed sailed to London, or Adelaide, to bring back the uh, the wool for the wool sales. So, uh, very famous mm. ship, and uh, Conrad really uh, appreciated the opportunity to uh, yeah. to serve on it. At one stage, he thought he might um, the captain would retire and he would become the new captain, but that that never happened, unfortunately. So, but that also participated, uh, you know, his his finalising the. Uh, the Elmire's Folly, which you've been working Elmire's on for folly. the last five years. So, yeah. And that was the end of his sailing life and the beginning of his, uh, of his writing life. Yeah. Yeah. And so, with his writing, um, with Elmire's Folly, and I think it was An Outcast of the Islands and several other of his books, it features really deeply flawed men as a protagonist. Um, is that a reflection of his life at sea um, in that he just met a lot of um, unsavory characters or sort of greedy characters, flawed characters? What, 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 why do you think that is? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I don't think it's only a result of his life at sea because almost all his books are about flawed characters. <laughs> yes. And this is what makes his book so different um, mm. from anyone else, any other English writers writing of that period. Mm. Um, because writers of that period, you know, there might be a flawed hero, but he would 
eventually recover, you know, marry the heroine and live happily ever after. Yeah. Whereas none of Conrad's characters ever lived happily ever after, or very few of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were all flawed characters. And, uh, you know, this might be a result of Conrad's life, his difficult life. Mm. Um, I'm sure there's many... PhD theses that have been critical <laughs> reviews that have been written on yeah on this aspect of his books. Um, so for readers of the period, his books were almost uh, Shakespearean in mm. in the sense of being drama dramas, uh, novels and dramas about flawed characters and and how they cope with. Uh, his characters were always living outside the mainstream of life. Yeah. You know, in these isolated islands or places. Um, so that makes what makes Conrad different. Uh, mm. And I mean, I'm sure there are many explanations about why he was different. But mm. uh, there was no one else in the world like Conrad, you know, that had yeah. the same experience as he had in his early life, mm. in his sailing life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he never had to search for characters or ideas he just had to remember his own experience yeah. of his of yeah. the first 35 years of his of his life which yeah, uh, yeah. makes him uh, prolific and, and also fascinating yeah. yeah i thought it was interesting that you wrote in your book that um that Almir's folly his joseph Conrad's first book was different because it's an english book which featured a dutchman a non-englishman living in somewhere far away that's not England where there's no sort of imperial presence, um, but it was it was very successful and people loved it. Yes, well, yeah, there are no English characters in that book, I think, um, except maybe the, uh, I don't know, he doesn't refer directly to the captain of Vida. So yeah. Elmire was, uh, was based on a real character, uh, Mm. A Dutch Indonesian, uh, probably Indo, and um, and all the other characters are, are basically, uh, you know, Indonesian or Malay or Chinese or whatever, but Arab. Um, and the book was a was a was a literary success. It mm. uh, wasn't a commercial success because it didn't have the characteristic of the time, which yeah. was a happy ending. Yeah. In fact, it wasn't until his, I don't know, maybe his ninth or tenth book, which was called Chance. So if anyone wants to read a Conrad book with a happy ending, that's, the, uh, <laughs> that's probably the first one that came out and was the first one that had a popular audience and put his name sort of in, in, you know, in sort of common knowledge or popular knowledge, which mm. was good for him because he, he really never made much money until then. But Chance sold lots of copies. It sold in America. Uh, it made him popular in America. Uh, oh, okay. It made him able to do book tours in America. So, uh, yeah, if you want a Conrad book with a happy ending, then please go to Chance. Uh, yeah. And I might add this. It's, it's, it's quite difficult for people to find Conrad's books now because he's gone out of popularity and most, um, you know, most booksellers, not many of them have his books and not many libraries have his books except sort of state mm. libraries and things. But for the readers, uh, the good news is that uh, um, uh, Project Gutenberg, um, which specialises in publishing out of print books and, out, and only out of copyright books. So Conrad books are all out of copyright and many of them, 15 or 20 of them maybe, have been published on with Gutenberg Press. So you can download the books um, online for free. So oh, wow. I'd recommend uh, people oh, do that. Know. Yeah. 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 So maybe there'll I, be a resurgence. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I ho hopefully, yeah. before we jump in, before I let um, open up the floor for questions, 
Um, I thought it was interesting that he, like you said, all he needed to do was remember. He would think of events that has happened during his life as a sailor. He would um, draw, it, it would influence him, but also the characters, like you said, Charles um, Almeyer is a base of a real person. And it, he's not the only sort of character inspired by real people, isn't he? There were a few others littered throughout his books. Right. Well, uh, Tom Lingard, the character Tom Lingard, uh, appears in three or four of his books, at least uh, at least three, um, Almire's Folly and Outcast of the Islands and The Rescue. And he was based on a real character Thinly disguised, because the real character was William Lingard, <laughs> and he, he yeah. renamed his character Tom Lingard. So I'm sure many people who lived in Singapore and around the islands would have known who William Lingard was. But um, mm. what I've done in the latter part of the book, uh, well, firstly, I, I tell the story of um, Conrad's sailing life, and then the story of his writing life, how he converted from a sailor and became a writer. And then at the, the last part of the book, uh, I've reconfigured those three books where Tom Lingard is the principal character because um, they're really told out of sequence. So his last book is where Tom Lingard is a young man, Almire's Folly, uh, he's an old man, so I've reconfigured or re, I don't know, re, reworked those books in the narrative mm. from a young man to a middle-aged man to an old man in terms of Tom Lingard. But I also tried to uh, give emphasis, emphasis to his Indonesian characters or his Malay characters, how he's uh, brought those to life, which he had a knowledge that... Uh, most other writers, and especially colonial writers, uh, wouldn't have. So he's brought mm. some new or better perspective to those characters. So yeah, I'm hoping that'll bring more interest to uh, to Conrad's books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I suppose maybe we could go to Ubud um, on site to see if we have any questions live from the audience over there. Nope, I hear silence, but we do, oh, here we are. We do have a question from an audience online. The question is, hi, Ian. How did Conrad get his work to publishers and get them interested? From Michael Pringle. Yeah, well, uh, it's a most unusual story because he, um, he'd never written a book before. Obviously, this was his first book. And I think he just chose a publisher out of, uh, you know, just out of the air, but he chose, um, I've forgotten, it's, it's Alan of subsequent uh, publishing uh, fame. But he sent the book in and uh, it would have gone into what we call the slush pile, or what's now called the slush pile. Uh, but the first reader, uh, and I should remember his name because there's, there's a lot about him in the book, um, recognized this as a uh, as really something very unusual and very mm. interesting. And it was because of this first reader, and I apologize for not remembering his name, uh, brought this this to the attention of the publisher. and uh, and that's how it got published. sort of within less than a year of it coming in, uh, it was published. And um, this same reader recommended that uh, uh, Conrad should write another book. And within less than a year, the second book, Almire's Folly, was published. Mm. So there's probably no one in publishing history <laughs> that's uh, yeah. ever had so much instant success as Conrad had. And, um, and uh, this, 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 this just goes back to how unique his life story was and his, his, uh, his knowledge of the East Indies and, and the archipelago and the characters who 
that he drew upon for his stories. Yeah. Um, uh, any other questions? I suppose well, while we wait for more questions to come in, um, it's interesting because Hello, uh, sorry. Yes, I hello. imagine. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hello, good morning. I'm Grace from Ubud. Uh, a question for Ian. Hi, Grace. So, the, hello. So this uh, theme about voyage, traveling, adventure has always fascinated me. But uh, the question is how to nurture such classical theme in this modern world? Yes, a good question. Um, obviously, uh, I'm doing my very best to bring Conrad and his books back to uh, to public knowledge and public interest because his his books have really fallen away uh, in terms of common knowledge and maybe amongst re readers, uh, sort of not specialist readers, but uh, readers everywhere. And especially, uh, you know, readers in Indonesia. I'm not sure how many of his books. I'm sure some of his books must have been translated into Indonesian, but I can't tell you how many. Maybe someone in the audience in Ubud can tell me. Um, but the, my, the idea of my book uh, was to bring knowledge of his stories back to life, uh, back to. Uh, to Indonesians and uh, many Indonesianists like myself, who are probably not fully aware of, uh, of the six books that he's written that are set in, uh, in Indonesia and uh, the East Indies at that time. Mm. So uh, unfortunately, his books have probably fallen out of uh, common reading or popular reading, but um, let's, hope, let's hope that uh, it, they will come back and uh, people will remember. Uh, his works. I wouldn't yeah. say that they're easy reading necessarily, but uh, they're certainly good reading. Yeah. Any other questions? I suppose what I'd like to know, and I don't know if you know this, but do the real people where he draw inspiration from for his characters, do they know that they're being written? Because I, I imagine right now, if you want to write a book, your publisher will ensure that you know no defamation costs will come from it or anything and he's written um he, very flawed characters based off charles almayer and um other other char characters so is there any indication whether these actual people know that they're being written hard for me to answer um mm. certainly uh, anyone living in singapore or borneo uh, would know that the um, yeah. you know Caspar Almayer was in real life Charles Almayer, so they're not yeah thinly disguised. Tom <laughs> Lingard was uh, was William Lingard. Yeah, uh, Carol De Vere, who was the character for Peter Willems, obviously is well disguised, and he was a one of the most flawed of uh, Conrad's characters. Mm. Um, and of course, the uh, the main character in Lord Jim, uh, who Conrad never he names Jim, but he never names his, his second name. So that's one mm. way of uh, of disguising it. Disguising him. it, yeah. But he uh, he was obviously a real character and lived on, continued to live on in Singapore uh, mm. for all of his life. Yeah. So. Uh, it must have been uh, difficult for him, uh, for many people around Singapore to know who he was and his role in the events of the Jeddah. But, uh, and he worked in the port. He worked as a, uh, uh, he worked in the port. So everyone would have sort of known his, uh, known his name and his experience, but uh, somehow he mm. overcame that and, uh, yeah. Wasn't like the Conradian character who had to escape to an un the last unknown place on earth to uh, yeah. to live out the rest of his life. Mm. We have another question from online audience. Um, how does Ian reconcile the criticisms of Conrad? Example is racism of his time, 
but literary merit or something else from Peter Morgan? Uh, sorry, could you just repeat that? I didn't catch all of the questions. Sure. How does Ian reconcile the criticisms of Conrad? So I think, for example, racism yeah. of his time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, he was writing in his time. The main criticism comes from uh, Heart of Darkness and his Congo characters. But really, he's writing from an anti-colonial perspective. He's not glamorizing any of the uh, mm. his con his his characters there. So, to me, that criticism and it's it comes from African writers is somewhat unjust. But I, you know, I'm not a uh, I don't have to defend Conrad. Um, there's some criticism about his female characters, uh, that they're sort of, what, they're not, uh, they're more two-dimensional than three-dimensional. But like, uh, Conrad lived his life without many females in his life. Um, and also related to the period of the time, it's not, not surprising, um, of this criticism of Conrad too, but I, that's why I included his description of uh, of Eugenie Renouf because mm -hmm. in the book, because it's just a wonderful, I think, a wonderful description of a female yeah. character. Uh, so I deliberately put that in the book. Um, his Malay characters, you know, he's not writing from a colonial perspective, so I don't see much criticism there so um yeah there's as i might have said earlier there's a whole there's a whole uh, industry of you know criticism of conrad book conrad's books <laughs> by you know by literary literary uh, people doing phds in literary criticism uh but to me uh, i think uh, you know there's, there's not a lot necessarily to be found in that criticism. I see, yeah. Um, we have not much time left. I don't think we have any other questions. Do we? Um, don't think so. I suppose hello, my hello. last question to... Oh, hello. It's me. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, can you see me? <laughs> um, Ian, you're fascinated by, you know, maritime um, stories, the ocean. Can you see the oh, I have to turn around. Oh, sorry, sorry, Marv, Marv. You get to see my nice hair clip, though. See, it's my, my daughter's. <laughs> see that? <laughs> <laughs> your money, eh? Ah, hello. Um, you're obviously hello. fascinated by okay. uh, sailing maritime stories, Ian. Uh, Tell us why, and do you plan to run one of your fantastic um, spice tours, you know, on the trail of Conrad? Is that a future plan of yours? Terima kasih. Ooh. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, Janet, there was meant to be a last chapter in this book where, um, you know, I would charter a vessel, perhaps one of the uh, sea trek vessels, but... Uh, and go and discover, you know, write a whole chapter about discovering this uh, this river, this e re river in East Kalimantan and this unknown uh, outpost that uh, Conrad wrote about 40 miles up the river. Uh, so this was going to be exciting to, to go up the river and describe the river in, in Conradian terms and the, the outpost, which, of course, is no longer a lonely outpost. It's a large or for, for Borneo, a largest city. Um, but that, of course, COVID, the over COVID at 19 got in that, uh, in the way of writing that last chapter. But um, mm. the ambition is still there to, uh, to rediscover that part of Conrad's voyage and perhaps other parts. So I'm hoping that uh, when we can get back to Indonesia and when uh, various companies, uh, start making voyages around, we can, uh, we can do that. And we'll invite you to come on board, Janet. 
That sounds amazing. Um, any other questions before we end the session? All right, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much for your time and for writing this fascinating book. I implore anyone who loves Indonesia to read it. Um, it's very educational or it's very entertaining and it's a lot of, it's a lot of drama, it's a lot of um, chaos of adventure if, if you're into that sort of thing. So thank you so much for being productive in 2020 and writing this fascinating book. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into the session. And thank you for supporting the Yayasan Mudra Swari Saraswati Patrons Program and to the festival's partner who made the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival possible. Um, please follow Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram. That's at Ubud Writers Festival, Twitter and Facebook, or visit ubudbrightersfestival.com for more information about the program. And um, with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>